this is the beginning of the recording of, I believe it's our third session together. Is it our fourth? Fourth. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My name's Dean Walker. I'm uh, being the technical host here on this uh, study group for a quite a remarkable book written by David Lloyd, um, Eco Dharma. And we're, uh, <clears throat> we're graced by the uh, presence of and uh, the tutelage of Tim Rempel, who's a very good friend of David Loy's. And um, Tim is, is walking us through the various dimensions of Eco Dharma each week in this uh, bi weekly series. And uh, it for those who are newly watching this recording, it's uh, important to mention that it's really not uh, particularly important that you have any kind of Buddhist practice. In fact, you don't necessarily have to have much familiarity with Buddhism of any kind, because David Loy, in his own way, it gives us such a, a broad overview of many aspects of, of the lineage or many lineages. And of course, Tim's there to fill in the gaps and to uh, bring it right to focus with regard to the, the subject matter. So um, just a reminder who I am. And uh, again, Dean Walker, and I'm the person to contact if you have technical difficulties, which I think a few people may have had tonight. And, um, and questions of any kind in between sessions uh, and my email address will be in the chat tonight, but it is always in the emails that we send out to you. So without further ado, Mr. Rempel. Oh. Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, Dean, if you'd put up that the first page of the, the three slides, I just want to update everybody a little bit on uh, kind of a, a tiny bit of a roadmap of, uh, like we're saying, we're um, in the fourth session. Uh, in terms of the book, um, we're doing this chapter each time. Um, and as you can see, April 7th, um, the, the chapter, the, uh, David's titles, and sometimes I <laughs> ad-libbed as it were. Uh, as you can see, I call this one Going Deeper, and I think that's maybe not a, not a bad way to describe this chapter. Um, the far right-hand column in this, um, is, as Dean mentioned, um, you know, people coming to this series from just a huge diversity of backgrounds of really no, you know, significant prior exposure to the, any of the Buddhist traditions or, or meditation, all the way to people who are uh, a decade practitioners of a certain particular um, Buddhist practice or set of practices. So uh, the meditation topic column is uh, just kind of by weekly, I laid out sort of an agenda of um, the second session. We did just a real quick um, introduction to sitting meditation. If you want to go back and look at the video of that, I'm not going to cover any more about that tonight. Do have just a couple of quick things to talk after we sit for a minute. And then in coming weeks, we want to talk about heart practices, namely Meta and Tong Lin. Um, want to talk about unified mindfulness and also want to talk about insight meditation because I think that's a um, you know, a, another very relevant um, form of meditation in the Buddhist world. Um, and in fact, you know, maybe do that is, is a little bit, not just me presenting, but really as kind of a, a, a group discussion because I'm from the Tibetan Buddhist tradition versus the insight tradition. So people are more familiar with that than I could speak to it more authoritatively than I. So um, with that, I think we're good with this slide. Um, and what I'll do, is what time we're at. Uh, what I propose is let's just sit for five minutes and uh, I'll ring the bell. Um, decided today I'll do just a very slightly guided version of meditation. Uh, last week just kind of did a little bit more of a Zen style of you just ring the bell and you sit and the Zen folks while you're sitting, you don't do a lot of talking. In fact, you do not. Um, Different parts of the Buddhist tradition are a little vary about that. Let me put it that way. So today we'll do it a little bit more of a guided one. Um, let me ring the bell and I'll be quiet and we can follow the silence as the bell um, tapers off into sitting. Uh, the final thing is in a 
comfortable, upright, relaxed position. Um, that's the way we do this in the Buddhist tradition. And, and um, by the way, some of the other practices that I mentioned, Meta and Tong Lin, are based on the same thing. So they have the same posture aspects. So uh -oh. with that in mind, we'll just sit for five minutes. Let yourself settle with your eyes closed, just watching yourself breathe. As your mind starts to settle, notice your breathing. Notice your diaphragm going up and down. Just like the gentle swells of the ocean on a calm day. Up and down. The breath blowing in and out. Notice in your body how sitting here feels. The feeling of sitting in the chair or on a cushion.
maybe let me first, um, before I dive into the couple of slides, I'll, I'll go through pretty quick. I don't have a lot I want to talk about. But first, I want to ask if anyone has any um, comments, uh, wants to share any experiences they've had in the last couple of weeks with, with doing sitting meditation, um, any questions? Um, so let me open it up first <laughs> for that. Yeah, and if not, Dean, if you could put up the second slide of those three and just just got a couple. What basically what I, what I want to talk about, just spend maybe five minutes tops, um, is this the the basic sitting meditation you can think of as kind of a framework that um, what I want to do is it, it kind of elaborate on a little bit, you know, like I mentioned, the recording of the second session at the beginning has a, a section of basic, very basic uh, sitting meditation. Um, and this really does tie into chapter three, um, because I think as, as David Loy explains in chapter three, in some sense, meditation is the way in um, that he talks about in there. Um, so, you know, it's it's an important topic in that regard. Um, this sort of what I want to do in this segment is to, is be pretty practice focused versus theory focused, um, and just provide a little guidance to lay out there for people who are a little bit newer to this. Um, as the slide said, and I'll just kind of talk to this stuff a bit real quick. Uh, yeah, you know, the very first and foremost thing yeah, is is being kind to yourself and patient and loving. And as I mentioned, they're just letting go the usual way that we're just, I don't know about the rest of you, but, but sometimes it's amazing to me the degree to which it seems like inside my head, I'm at war with almost everything, including myself. And meditation is a way to learn about intention. And the first with yourself, because I think it really, you certainly intention with respect to other people is a very important thing but sometimes overlooked is intention with with respect to ourselves um and one of the intentions you can hold is being forgiving um being kind with yourself and this practice is a context where you can do that that instead of the usual judgment stuff you can kind of slowly deprogram a little bit maybe a lot about that and get a little bit free of that. Um, it really is about experience and it's about thoughts, bodily sensations, you know, the whole thing. Um, and really watching them arise and do whatever they do and then they go away. Um, you know, I don't have a thought, a single thought that lasts very long at all. Um, certainly doesn't last anything like a, an hour or some such. Um, as you become more accustomed to this, I jokingly call it time of mind. A little footnote there it's a reference to an ancient 19 well right about the very end of the 70s 1980 steely dan song that i contrast that with what i term there the constant impact continuously from moment i wake to moment i go to sleep in the chattering monkey mind, which is is the next couple lines there you know meditation is a time where it can can allow myself to be a little bit less drawn by desires and a little less less driven by fears and not so busy just walking the same path habitually over and over and over in my life making those roots deeper and deeper and deeper um that instead i can you know have a brief pause and not do that um but sometimes there's some tricks if you um advance it to the next one dean let me just talk at those real quick um, just again, some kind of practical guidance on this stuff. Uh, you know, has suggested people start out five, ten minutes, you know, and then incrementally build up. Um, and the stuff I'm about to talk about, yeah, it'll work until you somewhere in the range 35 to 45 minutes. If you try to sit for longer than that in one crack without getting up, you get into issues of depending on your age and all, you know, there's it can be physical issues, it's 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 just hard. Um, and in fact, one thing to recognize is much past about 15 or 20 minutes, one of the things some of the teachers uh, recommend is 
actually approach it as sprints instead of one great big thing. Uh, so what you can do is, for example, let yourself get settled at first, you know, recommend with the eyes closed, gonna let the, you know, the mind settle a little bit. Let us start watching the breathing. Let us start looking at the body, noticing where you're, you know, noticing your the feeling of your clothes on your skin, noticing the feeling of your hands on your arms, all of that. And as that starts to, as I mentioned, that's where the, the I love the, the metaphor, I guess it is, of the rising, you know, the swells in the ocean. It's just the breathing, the up and down motion of the diaphragm. Once you get into it, it's just like that. Sometimes it's just, it's actually amazingly gorgeous, I think, just to sit and notice you don't have to consciously do a damn thing. It auto does it. It's, a, it's a remarkable. Um, and that awareness is kind of a, an interesting awareness of awareness uh, kind of thing, that the awareness of the rising, dwelling, and ceasing. You know, once you really start to let that happen and you notice that everything has that kind of transient quality, that's great. And you can do that, you know, like like I suggest, your five, 10 minute segments, and then give yourself five minutes, you know, sometimes it's just not doing any particular practice. Like next time when we talk about meta and Tong Lin, you could, you could get settled, then you could do a few minutes of Tong Lin, and then you could just back go back to just simple sitting meditation and then do Tong Lin for a few more minutes again and kind of alternate. Uh, during a session. Uh, none of the segments have to be very long, but I think they can be a really effective way to, to approach this, you know, break it up kind of into pieces rather than have it be one big monolith and therefore be a little scary. Um, next segment is just about mental distractions. Um, yeah, they do arise. Um, it happens, happens no matter how long you've been doing this. Um, one thing to remember that is just reassuring is they are transient and the whole point of sitting meditation is come back to your breath. Um, a couple other techniques uh, that I put down here, they're kind of interesting. One of them is uh, counting out breaths to 21. And if you get distracted, you start over and you count to at most 21 and then repeat. Um, and as it says, it builds concentration and focus. And if you practice that, it really, really does. Um, another one I love that's um, very much like we'll discover next week about Tong Lin, which, is, which rides the breath as the Tibetans put it. Um, a prayer that rides the breath, if you will, um, is it's an in-breath, out-breath thing. Because after all, if you didn't have both, you'd either, you'd either die of lack of oxygen or you'd blow up like a balloon and explode. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you got both. And one practice that's really nice that I like is on the in-breath, use you can use thoughts very selectively. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the Unified Mindfulness piece about labeling things and whatnot, but is very gently on the in-breath here and on the out-breath now. And on the in-breath here and on the out-breath now. Um, and again, you can do these major is just back to the upright, dig, you know, dignified and regal posture um, that if you get uncomfortable, move around, um, one of the pieces about 45 minutes is, I don't know if you can see on the video, but it's like at one point, if you're sitting on a cushion, if your legs out, maybe every 20 minutes or so, if you start to have your legs fall asleep and all, pull them up and you can just sit in this position, that's fine. Um, so just a few things to think about, tips, sort of <laughs> tips of the trade, if you will, um, that I wanted to share with people. Like I say, especially the, the thing about starting, getting calm, doing a practice, maybe doing a little sitting in between, going back into the other practice, and if you have more toolbox, this will really, I think, help um, help structure practice for you and make it interesting. Um, you know, because um, like I say, with the hard practices, which I, I, I final bit about that, I would strongly recommend sense behind it, it's determined by the scan machines and all the fancy technology nowadays. If you do heart practices, that has a different signature in your brain, if you will, than regular sitting practice does. And by the way, transcendental meditation has a third signature. So those three are very distinct. And, that, and that's why I think it's really good as you develop a practice to both have a calm abiding aspect 
but also some sort of a hard aspect. Because um, it really, you know, opens you up. And uh, as, it, as was recommended by the Buddha himself, it's a good thing. So <laughs> we'll leave that there. Um, well, like I say, we're good old chapter three. This, this, this is a, this is, this, let me, we can kind of walk through this thing a little bit, but I, I figured maybe um, shut me up open, <laughs> open it up for discussion. I'm just curious if people's reaction to read through chapter three, what did you think of it? <laughs> as you can tell, by, by my title slide, when I said going deeper. Huh. <laughs> I was curious too, again, the, the question about questions, if people have questions about anything. I really love this chapter as well. It, was, it felt really hopeful and I mean, um, Thing about the uh, the earth having rights and that sort of thing. It's just uh, just love that. For me, I same as I think with Chris. I connected more to this chapter than I did to the last one. The last one, even though I I liked it, my mind wanted to go and figure it all out. Right. With this one, it just really touched me in certain places and I sort of intuitive understanding of what he was talking about. So that the difference between the two. You know, I'm, I'm not much of a <clears throat> cosmology guy or astronomy, you know, the infinite nature of the universe and the billions of stars and so on. I, I get lost very quickly. I can barely make it to the moon and, <laughs> and I'm already kind of uh, not, not attending very well. Uh, but there's a way that, um, that this chapter also, uh, the way David Lloyd talks about the, the infinite and it's available through the very personal level, you know, basically sitting and, and deploying my attention really locally. Um, there's something about that that worked um, for me. So I, I just wanted to say that because it's uh, it's rare to find um, a, a, a way of accessing the infinite that it seems like it works for so many other people like that, the astronomy and the galaxies and so on um so i was it was helpful and um affirming <laughs> that i could, could relate um i think that for me it, it was a big i agree this chapter and um uh the notion of of living in a world uh in a utilitarian mindset um, and and how he dismantled this or begun to he began to dismantle that 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 mindset that that we're so deeply embedded in but the way he brought it out to the fore so that the reader could become reflect and become more aware of how it is that we live in this world trying to figure out how I can use that so that I can get that. Right? It was great. I loved it. I and and I I see where he connected that whole idea of dismantling that mindset with um giving the earth rights with the notion of, of earth rights and the nat the the rights of nature. I'm sorry, I thought I had. Um, so I was talking about meditating in nature. And I realized that 
I don't have a practice of meditating in nature. Um, in this last year since COVID, um, I've been isolated in my house and I just happened to have a Douglas fir forest in my backyard. And so I have been going out there regularly and sitting up against one of those big old fir trees and doing my practice out there. And I can just tell you that I, I don't know what I kind of, I don't even know, I don't, I, the words don't work to say the difference that I experience in having my spine I feel like I get a download of, I don't know, love, wisdom, insight, I don't know, but it is uh, the most calming thing I've ever done. And I do, I go out there at least twice a week and do my practice out there. And it's just, it's the sweetest thing. Wow, that is so cool. That is just so cool. Yeah, that is one thing that, that David and the and fellow teachers up at Rocky Mountain Ecodharma Retreat Center are, are, and a couple of them are big on, have done multi-decades of, you know, retreats in nature and, you know, hour bound kind of stuff. And, you know, that combined with, with meditation. And um, yeah, I know what you mean, Patricia Faith. It really is a something about being outside or, for me, even just being somewhere where I could see outside, not even having to physically be outside, just being connected to it, especially visually, but visually and then kind of, I feel like, you know, the only thing between me and, I mean, it's all nature and the only separation is this silly window, you know? And in the summertime, the window would be open. The window in the winter, it just happens to be closed. Yeah, you know. yeah, that is that is really cool. That is really cool. Yeah, I was going to ask too, kind of relatedly, um, about the whole notion of uh, that comes up here about you know, like the the animism and the reconnection with nature that way and you know concluding the chapter i think yes with blake <laughs> blake of all people um for everything that lives is holy um and then that kind of pushes you know invites the the idea of what's the boundary of lives you know obviously mammals birds fish insects maybe microbes trees well they're alive you know they certainly grow and go through growth processes um you know, you know how it is it kind of too to me begs the question how how far out i mean is probably a rock's not alive in a conventional sense of things but hmm. i think even if you get as far as you know all of the animal world and plant world and <laughs> working on the microbes and seeing them as alive even though you don't physically see them you know what I mean? I think that's, like you were saying, Rebecca, that's so dramatically different than the completely utilitarian perspective that we're programmed with that, like David points out, you know, you, you know, a cup is a function and I don't even think of it as a thing so much as I think of it as a function. You know, love where he talks about, you know, in modern society, you reduce everybody else, you know, you're a clerk, you're a waiter. You know, and maybe we even do that to ourselves. I was curious what what people thought of that about that whole animism kind of idea. Well, I I really appreciated uh, Dean the email that you sent out, and it led me to do a little bit of investigation. I looked, I wasn't familiar with the word shunyata. And so I Googled it and I found a whole bunch of stuff. And I listened to this one um, talk by Thich Nhat Hanh 
on shunyata, which uh, he says is emptiness. And um, there was this orchid behind him and he looked at the orchid and he said, the orchid is empty. And he said, I don't mean that there's nothing there because everything is there. The orchid is empty of a separate self. But inside the orchid is the sun and the rain and the dirt and the worms and the beauty, you know, it's like it interbees. Thich Nhat Hanh loves that word of interbeing. And um, so that, that was really meaningful to me. I mean, and then he, he talked about the son and the father, the son or the daughter and the father and mother. And you can't, in, within the son is the father. And, and the son cannot be empty of the father, but the son is empty of the separate self. I'm not doing that very well, but at any rate, um, it's, it's something to contemplate this idea of emptiness, nothing there, no birth, no death, that being our true nature, that, 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 emptiness and yet within the emptiness lives the potential the possibility for all there is just no separate self yep yep too bad <laughs> yeah that's the thing um and rebecca i think mentioned this last session the yeah one of the ways of describing emptiness because um that is kind of such a um, tricky word or problematic word um, in a way is that whole idea of, of, of infinite potential, the potential for all things. And th that's the emptiness. I did notice too in this chapter, you mentioned too that of course, uh, Nagarjuna um, points out that emptiness is of course empty. He was a formidable logician. Um, there's a thing called his fourfold negation that I won't go into. It's a little bit gearheadish, and it, but it's beautifully constructed, and it just it's designed to get you out past thinking of things in logical terms because you can't. It's like a Rubik's cube. You can't. I don't know, like get around it. I don't know how else to say it, but yeah, and it's it's. That's the thing that's, that's cool about it because the emptiness is itself, it's not empty and it's not a thing. <laughs> and, you know, that kind of logic really sort of does push you to the, the limit of, wait, wait a minute, it's, it is, but it's not a thing. And it's not no thing, it's not nothing. Emptiness is not nothing in the sense that that would be no thing. Well, it's not a thing, so it can't be nothing. <laughs> In fact, it's everything, but it's not like literally everything. It's the potential for everything. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Technically, good for that. Yeah, yeah. His stuff in, in inner being. I think of him as Mister Interbeing. Um, he's that's <laughs> one of his hallmarks. But he's exactly like you say, Patricia, that everything being inter interdependently arisen. You're have the son with father it's just you know biology is biology just not going to happen um, we're all everything's that way is inter interdependently originated um, so yeah that's that's where there's there's chunks in this chapter that get pretty deep i, I by the way i love um, his uh, david's rendering of the Tao, the Tao. You know, it's just, it, it's, it's so Taoist. The Tao, 
that can be doubt is not the constant doubt. The name that can be named is not the constant name. Having no names is the source of heaven and earth, uh, which is a you know, Chinese and Taoist metaphor for heaven and earth. You know? um, having, having names is the mother of the 10,000 things and so on. You know? Yeah, I thought that was just it's like, woof, you know. Um, And, it, and it's pretty cool that he, and then he proceeds to unpack that a bit and help explain it. That, yeah, it's just... yeah, that was one thing I loved about it. It's this wild mix of between very concrete stuff about, you know, what's happening in, you know, Ecuador or countries and rights of the earth and all that stuff, all the way to the other end of just about as deep as you can get, you know. And sort of all points in between, and a zillion references to, you know, kind of quotes and little snippets from people. I mean, this chapter is so dense and that's just crazy. But uh, but I love that about this because he's like, he's good at making his points, but also using, you know, as you can tell at the end of each chapter, he has a whole set of quotes, and David loves quote. Um, using little snippets from other people to illustrate his point. Mm -hmm. The thing about the rain, water dropping from the sky. Oh, yes. That, yeah, that I said. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I just have to say that what my little mind said in response to that was, well, you're still using labels when you say water dropping sky. You know, what's the difference in those words and the using the label <laughs> rain? You know, anytime we're using language, we're labeling things and it takes us away from the essence of that thing. So we should just all be quiet. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That, I just had to throw a little bit of that in there this this week and the stuff I said about uh, yeah the Majamakan stuff because it's because uh, it does get into this in this in this chapter because the whole the whole notion of you know we can talk about um, shunyata or you know emptiness or whatever word you want to pick for that on the one hand. Um, and then you can talk about consensus reality on the other. And there's, you know, that's mentioned a bunch of times this chapter about, you know, consensus reality. And kind of put it out there that, you know, for reference, uh, in the Buddhist world, um, like I say, I think of us as we're kind of the guys out at the end of the road. Because right out at the very end of the road is a cliff of infinite ex ex height. It's called ineffability. And it's exactly what you were talking about, Patricia. Say it's where you run right off the end of language, and therefore you can't say anything. Nothing. Um, and that whole uh, Nagarjuna, who so influenced Mahayana Buddhism, was, was kind of the father of that whole thing. And it really is the, the idea, the, the the truth of the true truth, the fact that consensus reality is here. Uh, it doesn't depend on my mind. The moon is there whether I'm looking at it or not. Like that. Um, it functions. It has rules. As the Tibetans say, you will not get an apple tree out of a pear seed. Not going to happen. Conventional consensus reality functions. But yet there's this other level underneath it that's the actual, you know, absolute nature of things, if you will. Um, and the fact that the true, the two are both true and unlike dualistic Western thinking, where if this is true, that can't be, or if this is true, this can't be. They're negations of each other. This is a case where they're both true at once. And that sometimes for people brought up in a very dualistic kind of mind, it's either good or it's bad. It's a sin or it's not. Um, Oh, I forget who it is. One of the popular country guys has a song out about that nowadays. Uh, I heard it a couple of weeks ago about how, you know, you're either going to go to church or you're going to go to hell. And part of the lyrics of the song is, wait a minute. 
it doesn't have to be either or. You know, it's not that polarized. It's not that dualistic. Um, Jim, yeah. could you tell me how you define truth? Oh. Yeah, actually I can, but it's it's in a way a cop out. What I do is I I flip over from English into Sanskrit. And in Sanskrit, I point out that the word truth and the word real are the same word. Admittedly, it's a cop out. And so then how do you define real? Uh, consensus reality. What is On that? one hand. That's perception, isn't it? Uh, it's commonly read on perception and the function of conventional objects. It's back to the uh, apple, apple seed and um, or pear seed and apple tree analogy thing that conventional reality is functional, um, it's causal, um, you know, stuff like that. Um, really independent of the humans, you know, it's not long before they were humans. All of this was here and it was all functional, just worked really. Uh, it still works well, of course. Um, cause in, in a, doesn't this, um, I guess the consensus reality, doesn't that show up in language only? Yes. Yeah, I think that's part of the deeper point that David was talking about in his chapter is that the consensus reality, you're indoctrinated into it from the time you start learning whatever your native language was that the group of humans you were born you know, around was speaking. And you would learn to speak like them, but even more deeply, learn to see the world in the way they saw it and use that language and how, um, how it encoded how you saw it. Um, let me give a specific example just for people watching the recording or something. If you think about like American, um, the, the Eskimos, a uh, deal about it works for snow. And being a, an avid skier, I maybe have 10, not 100, but I've got a good 10. And you, if you were an Eskimo, you'd learn 100 you know, progressively and eventually you make very fine grained distinctions just like your, your grandparents did about the snow. And you'd learn to do that because of the context and language. If you're in Polynesia, you'd learn none of that about snow because there is no snow. But you might learn things about the ocean instead and fish and stuff like that. You know, to me, it's that, yeah, it's the consensus stuff. You're right, Patricia, it's all, that's what I love about this chapter is, yeah, that part of it is all bound up in language, if you will. Now, Werner Erhard used to say, there is no is world. There's only a shows up world. And the shows up world is all perception, your perception, my perception, but really there is no actual is world. Oh, yeah. The thing you've got to be careful, and this gets into Buddhist philosophy are probably deeper and I, want, I really want to go in this, but yeah, there's what was referred to as the mind only school. And that is that it's only in your mind. Well, from a Majamican point of view, we, we refute that because we point out that to put it one way, if it was mind only and you died, you could, before you died, falsely conclude that when I die, it'll all go away. No. What'll happen is you'll convert to a corpse and your perception of the world will not be in that corpse. You can go up and talk to a corpse, it does not hear. If its eyes are still open, you can look at it and wave your hands, it does not see. It's that, you know, the perceptual piece of it, yeah. But the, the the fact that for me, the world doesn't exist unless for me, I look at it. It's not a statement about the world. 
It's a statement about me. And that's the distinction. Uh, and, and it's it, admittedly it's a little bit technical, but it, because in a way, how do I explain it? If you're not careful with it, that thinking it doesn't exist if I don't think it or see it, that elevates you above the world. That's not the case. Well, I'm not talking about my separate self, me. I'm talking about the larger, the the true nature. We are, we the world is inside of us. <laughs> you know, if if we're looking from that big picture perspective. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess in summary, I'd say, yeah, for sure. The world's inside each of us because each of us is like a little pool of water reflecting the world that's outside of us. The consensus part of that, by the way, is kind of a couple fold that you and I like agree that the sky is blue, that we have consensual agreement. I understand. You know, lacking like some detail about somebody who's colored or whatever. Yeah, that we're all sort of agreeing on what's here and um, agreeing that it functions and agreeing that it sure surely appears real. And if I try to walk through the wall over there, it's going to feel real, no, real, real when my nose runs into it. And it doesn't matter what's going on inside my mental state, or at least pretty close. I'm not getting through that wall. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, Tim, I have a question. Um, sure, 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 please. So we're talking about the consensus reality piece, which is like page 79. Okay. Um, Nagarguna. Nagarjuna? I don't know how you say that person's name. And it's the second to last paragraph in the final verse of the same Nirvana chapter, Narvarjuna points out the missing third term. As translated by Mervyn Sprung, ultimate serenity, Shiva, is the coming to rest of all ways of taking things. The repose of named the repose of named things. No truth, Dharma has been taught by Buddha for anyone anywhere. So I'm confused about what the repose of named things means. Because we're talking about consensus reality that we create whatever we agree with in our in this group because mm -hmm. we're in the same culture in the same country on Zoom where someone else might have a totally different consensus reality, right? In another totally different place on the planet. So there's that piece, but this repose of names things, how, I'm confused by that. Oh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, I, in my notes, in the, in the book where I read that, I made a little note that's just like, oof, just off the charts, yeah. Right, that's... I'm like, <laughs> I underlined it, it's like, what? Yeah, yeah, what, I, I, I think what he's talking about there, Gavin, is, is kind of a couple of things. One of them is um, the idea that, um, especially in the Zen world, uh, and he talks about that, that a little bit in this chapter, that the real, the focus of the problem and the, the ultimate cause of suffering is, like he talks about his teacher is not so much the clinging side of things and grasping, which for sure can be a problem, but is more the conceptual side of things that I'm trapped inside conceptual uh, obscurations is what we call them in Tibetan, okay. in the Tibetan tradition. And in fact, just real quick in that, it kind of the graduated path is I've got to work on conceptual or excuse me, emotional obscurations like anger and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. If I can get those under control, then the next big frontier is conceptual because I think it's kind of to turn what's his mother, the French philosopher's thing on his head. It's because I think I'm screwed. Right. 
in the sense that if I think thinking is the answer, then I'm going to apply that methodology to trying to become awake, which isn't going to work because I'm trying to think my way to awakeness. Right. I'm trying to use concepts to get there. And the whole deal is concepts aren't, they aren't the path. They just aren't. Um, experience is the path to say what it is. It's experience, not concepts. It's experience. Um, experience of thoughts, experience of feelings, experience of body, experience of, right, but not just thoughts themselves. Um, and that, I think, is what the piece about is the repose of named things. The repose is, um, it's back to the idea, we're talking, Patricia and I were kicking around a minute ago, about if you look at it and think of it as rain, the technical term is you've imputed, I-M-P-U-T-E-D. You're, you're projecting something out of your mind onto this thing. Mm -hmm. and giving it that label that name if you quit doing that then naturally you'll settle in a state of just experiencing you might still well have thought but it's more like they're going by than you're inside them you're more outside okay yeah that's where i think of it is this wild thing about um in a weird way, it's kind of like the whole idea of grasping creates the grasper and that which is grasp, grasp. Yes. As soon as you stop grasping, then the thoughts just and emotions and everything just kind of flow by. Um, and here I am sitting there kind of watching this happen or being this happening. I don't know quite how to put that, but. Um, yeah that's why i was joking in that one slide i showed near the beginning of time out of mind you know i really love that phrase right. because it's the whole and you know it's crazy this guy's way back 78 79 um that is one of those things because we get so little of that and in the intervening decades you think about it nowadays the barrage of stuff and your personal you know in your cell phone and it's just like oh my god you know could I ever unplug from this crowd? Does that does that help, Kevin? Yes, it does. Cool. Yeah, that was that was one of the yeah real nuggets in this in this chapter. The idea of time out of mind, right? Yes. Create space. for one to be in does that mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah it does it does okay. because i think that the other thing to kind of recognize about all this is there's this um he doesn't state it explicitly in this um but there's sort of this notion that um like you have your awareness and the awareness is like a more fundamental quality. It's like, it's, it's the awareness, if you will, is the space in which the thoughts can arise. Or another way I think of that is like, um, and it's talked about in the Tibetan tradition a fair bit, is like your awareness meeting reality, meeting the external world. And then what we were talking about a second ago, that the external world's out, out here, but if my awareness goes to zero because I turn into a corpse, eh, too bad for me, um, you know, I'm not then noticing because I got no awareness, my awareness is gone, so it's not meeting the world. But while it's life, my awareness could meet the world and I could perceive the world. And, and that, that ability to perceive is sort of space, if you will. And really, that's in you know, in a deep sense, that's what, what meditation is about is about um, sitting and having your awareness meet your own nature. 
you talk about reconnecting with deeper self, that's really kind of what this is about, is you didn't have to invent your awareness. It came with, been with you ever since you were born. Um, and, you know, the reconnecting with your nature, your nature didn't, um, you were born, I don't know if it make, will make any sense, you, your physical body were bo was born, but the nature of you wasn't. Right. Neither will the nature of me ever die. Exactly. And that's where that chapter back that we were talking about in the unbornness in there. Yeah, that sometimes it's a little hard to get your head wrapped around at first. What's he talking about? Yeah, it's exactly that. That, that quality. I didn't invent. I can't destroy. And it's like you say, it, it being not born, it won't die because it's not it's not in the in the realm, so to say, of coming and going. You know. <laughs> like I say when I, when I put on the, the the slide about the the uh, the chat now this one is for me at least is a little bit going deeper in spots it's like <laughs> In a, in, a, in a way, too, you know, the other thing that struck me about it is, is about this chapter is interesting. There's all this sort of philosophical stuff almost, certainly very deep stuff, um, very profound stuff. Um, and then on the other hand, there's stuff about like, you know, um, you know, the exploitation of the environment and, you know, thinking that because, you know, the view that nature is a thing. It's just, um, you know, yet another thing in the world that we have dominion over and we just use to convert, you know, to profit and all of that. Um, I think it is part of what Lloyd's trying to contrast is, you know, that sort of a worldview in a very conventional one like that um, versus this very, um, animistic worldview that, um, you know, like, for example, overlaps a lot with how the American uh, Indians see the world. And in fact, he talks about that a little bit in one, at one point in the chapter here about the, the guy and his cooking, how you might think of it as a cooking pot. But to him, the whole thing is holy. The water is holy. The meat's holy. The fire is holy. The cooking pot's holy. You're holy. I'm holy. Everything's holy. You know, you know, I remember, you know, I, I found it interesting, you know, the guy that David quotes talked about, we Indians think about these things a lot. We notice you guys don't. You know, <laughs> and kind of by implication, we do feel sorry for you. <laughs> we really do. And we say prayers in our, you know, <laughs> I mean, get over all your European craziness, but boy, we've been with you guys for 500 years now, and holy crap, you don't seem to be getting any better. <laughs> I'm not careful, I'll start channeling John Trudell, the uh, great philosopher king of the American Indian movement, and poet and musician, and just generally crazy guy, an amazing person. What's his name? Uh, John Trudell. I'm in trouble to see him today. So I don't, I don't know if this is a direction that other people will be interested in, but I, given the immense financial inequality uh, around the world, and particularly in the USA and so on, um, there, this whole part about um, 
he, you know, talks about Jean-Jacques Rousseau and, and Enlightenment philosophers and Locke and about property ownership and so on. And in this one place where he seems to sort of sum it up, he says uh, the Lion's Roar Sutra tells a story about a kingdom that collapses when the ruler does not give property to those who are impoverished. And he says, um, the moral is not that poverty induced crime should be punished severely or that poor people are responsible for their own poverty and should work harder. But the moral is that the state has a responsibility to help people provide for their basic needs. It's a pretty pointed political, you know, almost a policy point. And so I'm just curious about that. I, I, I'm not aware of much in the way of a, a political involvement with any of the Buddhist lineages. <clears throat> And that's just my pure ignorance. I don't know shit. But I'm curious about that that particular segment. If you have anything to say, great. If anybody else is curious about it or has anything to say, great. And I can let it go if it's not of interest. So, Well, I don't know very much about the Buddhist perspective, but what just comes to mind immediately is loving kindness. And that, mm -hmm. to me, is such a Buddhist thing that if you indeed do no harm and if you are embracing all of life in that loving kindness prayer, then aren't we taking care of it all? I mean, that's pretty close to that policy, I think, Dean, that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know either, you know, whether there's any, um, policies that are based on buddhist principles or but it'd be interesting and so i what comes to me is a question and that is how does bhutan which my understanding is that bhutan i think is the only country in the world that is um the political system is buddhist is fundamentally buddhist hmm. and i wonder what their policies are around economic inequality um, to create to create fairness and equality or, or to create fairness. Yeah, boy, yeah. That's, yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't. I don't know the answer to specifically for, for Bhutan, especially. Um, Yeah, the the I guess a, a, a couple of things that do come to mind. Say just real quick. One of them is yeah, historically, um, as he's pointed out in here in, in, in a couple spots that you know historically, um, you know, the Buddhist path is a very individualistic thing, and and. Um, You know, the um, where it's existed, it's existed across so many different cultures, starting in India and China and Japan and Southeast Asian countries and Tibet. And um, it's, it's because it's so focused on individual, and this is, you know, one of the things that David talks about in a number of places in the book, because it historically came out of a, a tradition of being so focused on individual liberation, it wasn't concerned so much about collective stuff or society stuff or any of that. Um, yeah, for sure, you're right, uh, Patricia Faye, you know, if, if you know, loving kindness is, is one of the cornerstones of, of the Buddhist philosophy. Um, but it's interesting how that ends up being enacted. And David can tell you, as somebody who studied in Japan for 20 years, and Zen, and knows the history of that is considerable death, that, you know, you go back to World War II times, for example, 
And there was no anti-war movement in Japan, you know, championed by the Zen folks. No, not at all. They were completely with the emperor and the war effort. You know, um, it's kind of funny how, you know, um, I think part of what, in a way, has allowed Buddhism to break across the world across time the way it has is the fact that it's sort of at this individual level and it didn't really talk about collective or society and and similarly it didn't sort of talk about the ecological context or the environmental context of this because you know 2500 years ago it's as, as, again as david pointed out in the book 2500 years ago when the historical buddha was around that just was just not a deal I don't know, I'd have to go look up the numbers of how many people were on Earth 2,500 years ago. I don't even think it was a billion back then. Um, you know, and I've heard, you know, like, for example, population estimates of the American Indians before the Europeans showed up and, and you know, both on the East Coast and West Coast with the Spaniards of this continent. A million people, something like that, I've heard. You know, it was not, by modern standards, a very large number for as big as this place is and they were spread out. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting that way that um, the, like you say, the Zen's War Sutra, there is this thing that, yeah, there's this whole notion of, um, you know, people in power should act consistent with the Dharma and provide for the people. Mm -hmm. you know? And if you don't, that's kind of David's point about the story from the Lions War Sutra, that if you don't, odds are bad things will fall. Well, you know, Joanna Macy's work, um, the work that reconnects the Welch government has been instituting some of that work in their whole legislature and the way the government in Wales works. And they're the only country that I know of as a country that has actually embarked on that. Yeah, the other one I would point out that I do know just a tiny bit about is Nepal in the official policy of the Nep Nepal Nepalese uh, government, as I understand it, is they measure gross uh, domestic happiness. In the Buddhist sense that Everyone should be free from suffering. Everyone should be happy, um, and everyone should be free from from suffering. And oh, so, Nepal and Bhutan and Wales and Iceland too. Iceland's got a whole bunch of that kind of stuff in yeah. their in their government, particularly where women are concerned. Anyway. Oh yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's 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 interesting. Yeah, and that's where yeah, kind of orientation. Um, certainly, there's more um, rather than put a political word on it. Let me word humanistic um, approach to this. That I think rather than um, kind of what sort of political system are you in, um, that it's really more a question what's your most fundamental or most overarching concern. Um, is it about profit? Is it about corporations? Is it about people in the natural world? Is it about what? And pretty clearly in this society, most modern Western so-called society and good part of the Asian society from what I understand, well, you know, Japanese, for example, uh, Koreans too, um, you know, is really about corporations and profits and all that stuff is the way an awful lot of this has gone. And, um, you know, and, and it's funny how we've remade the world. I mean, to say something maybe very controversial, you know, if you look at China and you think about the historical sweep of, of that country and you think about the fact that Zen is in Japan because Chuan in Chinese was the Buddhist tradition there from which Zen descended, so to say. It faded in China and in recent times, 
they've squashed enough religions and what little they'll leave the people to have is stuff that's compatible with the economic and political system they're trying to promulgate. And we'll let you have, you know, as long as your religion, spiritual, whatever stuff doesn't conflict with what's really most important, you know. Um, and sometimes I think we've done, whether we really want to admit it or not, basically the same thing in the United States, you know. That, you know, corporations and profit are the foremost thing. And it's a question of every, everything being compatible with that and anything that's incompatible with that, throw it out. You know, we're not having none of that. But what I find very contradictory is that in, um, I'm actually calling in, in from Ireland, hello. <laughs> so different, but it's the same, I, I, I presume across the world that we, we teach our like teachers and we teach about childcare and Maslow's hierarchy of needs is within that. And, and, and that is, you know, for people to feed themselves and to be able to house themselves. So even when governments are, you know, in policy, we're still through our education systems and teachings talking about this system, which we're not even using ourselves like there are people going hundred there are people that can't are homeless and so I just find that's a very interesting contradiction that what we're actually teaching future children future teachers is contradictory to what we're actually doing policy making it's an observation thank you thank you yeah that's so cool you're joining us from Ireland. <laughs> it must be quite late there. Yes, it's I mean, yeah, quarter past two in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> There's a commitment. Yeah. Indeed, yes. Yeah, I'm all new to the a bit new to the subject. So um yeah, it's very interesting so far. Wonderful, wonderful. to have you here. Yeah, it is. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Yeah, and it is so crazy. It's like, and and that's the, the thing that I think one of the points too that I, I came away with from this chapter is the whole thing about how impactful language and all the stuff around that, and and you know the social conventions and all that is that how, good lord, how that just colors and channels and shapes and contains and you know so much um, and that it's all artificial you know you could i could have been born you know a thousand years ago in a in a different civilization and learn have learned a different language and have learned to see the world in a different way um well and recently there was a third great the civilization, I forget the name, the Mesopotamians, the Egyptians, and the third one. The third one lasted almost 2,000 years. They've discovered in the last 100 years how extensive, and best they can tell, they're one of the civilizations that invented writing. Um, apparently, verbal language and humans have you know, been around for forever, basically. And in, the, in about 2,000 years, they that they existed at their peak, they occupied an area twice the size of France, and they never had wars. In two thousand years, yeah, I'll have to remember. I'll get you the name next time. But yeah, it's just remarkable that you know our view of things and how we're taught and how we see stuff is we cling to it so much because it's what we were taught. We sometimes fail to realize, well, you know, it's really pretty arbitrary, guys. You know? um, and, you know, we could, we, we do have the possibility to, to imagine certainly radically different worlds. You know, that's the whole thing about you know, hopefulness of it in a way is that um, certainly we can, if nothing more, um, imagine different ways of being 
different ways of acting with each other. And if we have the courage and the dedication, in the time we have, we can go try and enact that, at least to some degree, um, and do so. Um, I think part of where the kind of the, the meta message of, of this whole book is going is based on the kind of stuff that's talked about in chapter three, a very deep understanding or, you know, certainly opening the doorway to relating to reality in a much deeper way. You have a foundation to build on for individual and collective action that's a lot stronger and richer than just we ought to, you know, than some sort of moral imperative instead of kind of feeling like I ought to, or almost feeling guilty that I don't, or something like that. But instead, it stands at exactly on its head. And um, I mean, that, that's like in the Mahayana. It said that if, if one day in your meditation, you just spontaneously dropped all the way to absolute bodhicitta, into absolute real, realization of the nature of things, spontaneously and effortlessly, compassion would arise in you that embraced everything. You wouldn't have to do anything to fabricate it. Because it's who we are. Right? I mean, it's like you the pear tree and the apple seed and we're seeded for love and compassion. Mm -hmm. We're seeded for a more beautiful world that we can imagine is possible. We can't help but create it. I mean, heaven on earth is, you know, earth is in heaven now. <laughs> Here, now. That's what gets me up in the morning. Oh. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, that's a, it. Really, is amazing that when, and that's our nature. That's our seeds, like you say, Patricia. Fay. And the thing that's so sad is whether you're in Ireland or on this side of the the Atlantic or over on the other side of the Pacific, it seems like you just get, you know, so much message from the society and the culture and everything that, you know, I mean, that's the game. It's a joke. <laughs> Yeah, the thing that's so sad is, is they're building. Sorry, say again, Patricia. I just, I, I know Buddhists don't say God, but I said God is playing hide and go seek with itself. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah, and actually that's a, <laughs> yeah, no, we, we don't refer to theistic stuff, but yeah, that, that's a, definitely a, um, um, certainly, a Hindu perspective on the world that uh, all the forms are the divine taking the form of everything to make this tremendous drama, you know, like a play. Um, exactly. For the amusement of itself and everybody involved. And it is one hell of a play, you'll have to admit. <laughs> You're in galaxies and whole, you know, it's like, whoa. Um, but, yeah, and, and, and it, it really do. I think that's, and that's part of what I think David's trying to, you know, a little bit in this chapter, because then, um, you know, getting near, real near the bottom of the hour here, just to maybe highlight what, you know, kind of comes next is, um, like I put in a little um, summary, I think of, um, David calls it is it the same problem you know, about what are we overlooking. I think if this, if the next chapter is one about really that takes what chapter three talks about and then sort of goes to, okay, given that, what's that mean for us individually and what's it mean for us collectively? And kind of, you know, um, building peace through the, if you will, for um, you know, engaged, uh, engaged Buddhism, if you will, 
Um, and certainly it's like, you know, the, on the, the back of the book, it, it talks about that ecodharma um, embodying the understanding of the Buddhist teachings and how it relates to the ecological stuff and, you know, broader implications and all. But embodying that understanding in activism that's needed today, you know. You know, activism, I think of on, you know, any scale, um, be it just activism of myself and my own thinking in my own life, just purely personal, and then kind of radiating out from there and, you know, sort of concentric circles of people around me and other people I know and groups I'm involved with and, you know, um, deep adaptation and extinction rebellion and extinction rebellion UK and extinction rebellion America and 350 and sunrise movement and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, that, you know, that if, if you can come to, um, what we talked about later in the book, the, the whole idea of an ecosatva, borrowed from the notion of a bodhisattva uh, in Buddhism, is somebody who's um, dedicated to activism and um, is trained enough to be willing to let go of that. Yeah, by the way, in the list of references I'll send out, there's a, there's a cute paper in Lions for about uh, being an activist. The problem with burnout, and it's like, he it talks about, you know, um, in terms of like heart practices and stuff, I promise not to burn out. It's kind of, bur burning out is in the title of the article. I'll send it out in one of the sets of links um, that I send out about stuff. It's, a, it's an interesting piece because there is that element. If you don't have that foundation and all you do is the activism, the risk of burnout is very, very high. Because, you know, there's just nothing inside to sustain you. And, and uh, there's a lot of frustrations on the outside coming at you. And, you know, it can be tough. It can be tough. I think that's why mindfulness and a meditation practice is just the core, the heart of activists, for activists to have that practice. Because when we're all frenzied and we go out there all frenzied, we're just adding to the chaos. So to go out in a calm and mindful state. Oh, yeah. Can, we can be, you know, that we can make a, a difference like that. Yeah, I've been on trainings, uh, Patricia Fay, for activist stuff, the nonviolent trainings, and like you can take sort of traditional and nonviolent ideas and marry them with some of the stuff we're talking about. So, for example, when you're sitting in the row, chained together, and the police are coming to arrest you, you're doing Tong Lin relative to them. Or you're chanting or... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Some practice like that. And that allows you that, that yeah. you have cultivated that stability that instead of freaking, yeah. you can just very calmly, and yeah, no, I'm not resisting arrest. You always pick me up fine. You know? um, Isn't that what the Chinese Qigong does? There's two names, Qigong being one of them. Um, Again, the Chinese government uh, stopped people practicing. I tai remember. Chi? No, it tai wasn't. Chi? It's not Tai Chi, but it's it looks a little bit like Tai Chi. But it's a they take uh, it's called Qi Gong. There is another word for it as well, and but they stand in like Tai Chi esque poses. There's certain mm -hmm. poses, but for long periods of time, and it's banned in. China and people were arrest, you know, arrested. So we, we, you see them all over Europe anyway, and we see them standing outside the government building, Chinese government buildings here, and they do sessions in the park. I've gone a few times and to learn with them, and it's, it's just a beautiful, you know, energy meditation and stillness. But yeah. now it's become, I suppose, a political activism to to stand still outside buildings and, and do that practice in peace and it's yeah. 
it's really powerful, really. Um, because it is about just standing still and connecting and, and being, yeah, there's no fighting, there's no, yeah, it's, it's interesting, I think that the Chinese government maybe are fearful of it because it's a calm practice. No one's doing any harm, they're meditating. Yet, it jars very much with their, obviously, politics or their control. Um, going back to what you said, Tim, maybe again, that individual power meditation in a sense, I suppose, gives people personal power. It's calmness, it's stillness, it's self. You know. yeah. yeah, I've been involved with Loy too, where like uh, the Zen peacekeepers and stuff will come out of the full Zen with the, I forget what they call it, the, the ordination bibs, it means you're ordained Zen, um, and sit with those folks in a whole line. And it's, it's, very, it's a very interesting kind of protest um, in activism context, because we're not standing up, we're not yelling, we're not doing anything to police, like in Denver, you know, I've done this you know, with, with David. And you just sit there and the police kind of look at you and they're just not sure what to do. because <laughs> you know, you're not you're not raising a ruckus. You guys you guys don't look like pro no, you look look guys look like religious people. What are we supposed to do, Captain? What what should we do now? <laughs> very very different reaction than I've seen from from that kind of thing in response to, for example, extinction rebellion protests there the response can be you know quite different yeah, yeah activism war stories yeah that's the thing that's interesting too by the way about david is david was old enough that he cut his teeth on that protest in the vietnam war so yeah, he's uh, seen this uh, activism and protest thing, you know, in, in a couple, three iterations over the years. Anyway, we're at the bottom of the hour and uh, anybody, maybe we can just go around and say goodbye. And, um... Ashley needs some sleep. <laughs> yes, yeah. especially you, Ashley, yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> I have a meeting at nine in the morning. There'll be lots yeah. of people. Oh, my. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank thank you all of you for being thank here. Thank you for finding me on yeah. the interweb. Mm -hmm. Patricia, I'm loving your cat. He's in my cat the best. Beautiful. Yeah. His name is Totoro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yes. For those who know Studio Ghibli uh, anime movies. Yep. Is he a main coon cat? I I don't think so. You he's, don't know. He's okay. He just hair. looks like he's yeah. big. He weighs like 16 pounds. Yeah. We have we have I have one in my house who's looks like that. He's, he's the huge most and he's a main coon. I've ever had. He's just amazing. Tim, are you going to send the slides out? Yes, I will. OK, thank you. And yes. um, for those who um, mm -hmm. might not have seen at the very bottom of uh, both of the emails that I sent out just recently before this one can, contained the link, or excuse me, the um, an attachment of the, the single screenshot that Tim shared with us last time. So I'll do yeah. the same thing this next okay. time. Okay. Yeah, and I, and I will, um, Gavin, yeah, get, um, you know, get those to Dean so he can send them to you. And then, uh, Great. like I say too, I'll put together next time for the, the meditation stuff and I'll get it out in advance is some links, um, some good material about um, meta, um, predominantly from the insight world, um, Jack Cornfield and group. And next about Tong Lin uh, from the 
uh, marvelous Pima children. Um, yep. That's those who know her, she's just beyond beyond. The woman is just amazing. Yeah. And, uh, and we'll get that done. Tim, are you aware of uh, Vinny Ferraro from Big Heart City Meditation Sangha in San Francisco? He's part of the whole Jack Cornfield Spirit Rock group. I meditate online with him and about 250 people every Friday night. He's pretty oh, amazing, tattooed everywhere. What a guy. <laughs> Vinny, if you ever have a chance to sit with Vinny, Vinny Ferraro. Interesting. Yeah, there's some there's some great folks on the on the slides. I will send out from that I had tonight. Uh, yeah, in this the the last slide on the very bottom, I, I put on credit both for my teacher uh, and also uh, Tara Lloyd Burton, who's an insight meditation teacher from the Denver um, Insight Center, uh, and and a wonderful person, just fascinating, fascinating, um, fascinating person. Yeah, Cornfield and the whole. Um, spirit rock and yeah there's there's a tremendous community out there and a lot of people and uh, a lot of really good stuff and yeah when i was getting into this 20 years ago you know jack's cornfield had written a number of books really excellent books right um, about heart stuff and two about how you practice and then you go do the laundry right exactly if what is it yeah, I love that. before enlightenment do the laundry after <laughs> do the laundry. Yes. Yeah. I love you guys. I don't want to go. I know. I don't either. But here we go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody have a good a good fortnight and I will see you two weeks hence. Thanks very much. Yeah. Take care.